If you want to enter the crypto market or start buying some crypto tokens, then today is the show that you want to be watching. Because what I've done today is I've got three of my friends with the highest alpha in crypto, and they're going to tell us exactly what they are investing in. With the market on such a rampage and everything moving up, you may feel like you've missed certain runs. But these guys have got the alpha from down under. These guys dig deep. These guys show you the tokens that haven't yet run. That's what the show is about today. So let's not waste time. We've got a lot of alpha to cover today. Let's get straight into it. I'm not kidding. Today is going to be one of the highest alpha shows per minute. And so instead of wasting time uh, with an intro, let's just get straight into it. What you need to do if you want more of this alpha is subscribe to the channel. If you're not already subscribed, where the hell have you been? You like missed the whole bull market with us. But the, the good thing is that there's still the biggest, most aggressive part of this bull market ahead of us. And uh, subscribe now. If you are a subscriber, like this content. The more you like the content, the more we explode the shows. You saw what happened to my show yesterday. I gave you so much alpha that YouTube actually got upset took down the show, took down the show. So today we're gonna try and bring you that alpha, but we're gonna try and temper it because we don't want, we just, we don't want people, we don't want YouTube to take, out, they take down our show again. All right, before we get into the show, remember that our Friday banters are brought to you by NordVPN. You're gonna make a lot of money in this bull market. That I promise you, you're gonna make life-changing money in this bull market, but a lot of people are gonna lose it. And you know what the sad thing is? They're not gonna lose it because they invested in bad protocols, because they held their profits long. They're gonna lose it to one of two causes. One is they're gonna lose it to hacks. The other one is they're going to lose it to governments that take their money in either tax or seizures. Why? Because if you're not using a VPN, then what you're doing is you're exposing your IP address to everyone. You're exposing it to exchanges. You're exposing it to DeFi protocols. You exchange, you're exposing it to everyone. And they keep a record of exactly every single transaction that you've made. And then one day when the government asks them for information of exactly who used their protocol in that country, guess what? Your data is going to the government. And I don't want to think about what happens then. Same thing with, um, same thing if you think about uh, being hacked. Hackers have your IP address. Through that, they can engineer a way into your computer and you can say goodbye to your hard earned profits. Guys, for less than $3 a month, you can protect yourself. I know a lot of you are new to crypto and you think everything's going to be fine. And it always is until it's not. Do yourselves a favor. There is a link below. If you don't know where the link is, just go under the video. There's a link here that says Nord Crypto Banter. Click that Nord, that Nord link. Sign up for a VPN. It costs you $2.98 per month. And that is just one way that you're going to protect your, 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 your money. Just imagine. Imagine that you make yourself $100,000 or $200,000. And that you click on a malicious link or that somebody hacks you because of an IP address and you lose it all. And then you go back and say, you know, I could have saved this if I just spent $2.98 per month. Don't be that guy. Sign up now. And once you have that, sign up for threat protection and Incogni. Incogni makes you anonymous on the web. It takes your data off the, um, off the dark web. And also threat protection blocks the malicious websites. I think what I'm saying to you guys is it costs you $10 a month to protect your hard earned money. But if you, if, if you make those profits and you lose them because of the $10 a month, you're going to hate yourself and I'm going to Hate you. Well, I'm not going to hate you, but you know what I mean. All right, listen, before that, uh, uh, with that out the way, let's get on with the show. Let's talk about, specifically, I want to talk about the cycle. I want to talk about the four-year cycle. I want to talk about whether this halving is going to have a huge impact. I want to talk about narratives that are going to run. We've got so much to talk about. Let's not waste any more time. Let's get straight into it. So it is getting very, very, very close to the halving. And I think the big question for me is whether this halving, mar halving cycle is actually still relevant and it is what's driving the market or whether this whole market is actually just being driven right now by the ETF flows. Uh, so let's bring in the guests today. You know most of the guests. We've got Jose with us today. We've got Pete from House of Crypto. We've got Thicky guys. Welcome to Banter. Welcome back. Thank you. So listen, Thanks let's talk. Having us. Yeah, let's talk about the market cycle, where we are in the market cycle. I saw that the halving is, uh, looks like it's going to be on 420. I mean, that looks like it's just programmed. Um, we did get the breakout pre the halving cycle, which was quite unique. People were calling it like a left translated cycle. They said the cycle may be going quicker than, accept, than expected. My view is that we just had one big catalyst, which was the ETF, which drove, which, which drove um, uh, flows in and drove uh, prices up. And we may get the halving, which will then bring us back into a normal cycle. Keen to hear your view. Keen to hear whether this is going to be a left translated cycle, fast cycle. Or this is going to be a, a cycle with two, two big uh, narratives, ETF and halving. 
Uh, you're just keen to hear where you guys think we are in the cycle. Thicky, let's start with you because you're the newest to the channel. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I think definitely the timing of the having like only maybe three or four months after the ETF has caused it to, you know, push very far. Now, obviously, the having matters a lot because what it means is that there's like uh, twelve billion dollars of supply at these current prices that is going to be removed from being sold. Uh, minor supply that is. Um, so like obviously the like market is pricing that in with the ETFs and like the having coming. Um, and yeah, I guess the question is like, do we keep going after the having, or is that like sort of maybe the top and all the narratives are exhausted for Bitcoin? So yeah, we'll see. Do you think that this, there is such thing as a left translated cycle, or do you just think that that's a crypto bros, Twitter narrative that was created and that the cycle will actually be as long as all the previous cycles? I'm actually not sure. I, um, I'm, I'm very hesitant to like look at previous cycles to like compare for this one, especially because the markets were so different back then due to like size and participants and so on and so forth. So I'm curious what the, the rest of you guys think about that. Uh, Jose, what do you think, sir? Um, yeah, I don't know if it's going to be a left translated cycle. I think it's we're in like uncharted territory, I'd say, with the, with, with the ETFs. Um, I don't think anyone expected this kind of reaction early on to the ETFs. Like when you speak to to people who are very close with RIAs and 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 like I spoke to someone recently who who sells software to, to RIAs quite to, to to quite a quite a high percentage of them, and what he said is that most most of them haven't even started offering Bitcoin to to clients. Right? They don't even know they don't even really know what it is yet. Um, and so like the marketing machine, the, the sort, of, sort of Larry Fink marketing machine, I, I would say uh, ha hasn't even really gotten started yet. Obviously, he, he, he's done some, but I think, um, yeah, I, I do think these flows are likely to, to continue. Uh, the having, you know, is almost never is, is historically has never been priced in. Um, I don't I don't think it's going to be priced in this time either, especially with with like positive flows kind of offsetting it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think there's a lot of, it seems like there's a lot of catalysts still on the, on the horizon. I still think, you know, you're seeing more corporates announcing buying Bitcoin, still waiting for that nation state to, to, to announce that they, that, that, that they bought some Bitcoin, which seems like it would happen this cycle. Um, you know, the, all the fundamental, uh, as in like fundamental macro sort of reasons for Bitcoin, I think are, are stronger than ever. With, with the world where it is now, with wars, with debt, with, with, with everything like that. But obviously Bitcoin is like on the t far end of the risk curve. So, you know, it, it's very sensitive to, to what ends up happening in, in, in global markets and clearly like a higher inflation print or, or, or something like that could, could have an impact. But for me, we're, we're definitely still in the, in the beginning of the cycle. I'm still, I'm still allocated accordingly. So I saw this chart earlier this week. It shows the total production cost of Bitcoin, which is the purple line. It shows the price of Bitcoin and then it shows the cost of electricity. And what it shows is that the price of Bitcoin has never fallen under the price of electricity of mining Bitcoin, never in the history of Bitcoin. And what you got to bear in mind is when the halving happens, that chart basically doubles. So it's, it's not an exact science, but the electricity cost doubles because the, the, the number of Bitcoin is actually halved. So, I mean, I know it's not an exact science because the hash rate has to play with it, but it does show that there could be an aggressive repricing after the halving. Pete, what do you think, sir? Well, big fan of Rao Powell. Rao Powell brings us to talk about the liquidity cycle rather than talking about the halving. Uh, liquidity, like global liquidity, basically he's charted up and basically puts it in line with uh, the halving cycles, which is actually quite an interesting thing because around the bottom of the FTX crash, or when was that, the end of 22, was sort of around where it bottomed. And then it sort of started to move up in terms of liquidity liquidity coming in last year you saw like china printing billions of billions of dollars worth of yuan you saw the us printing tons and tons of money and i never really kind of understood what like you know the idea of all this liquidity arriving in the market meant for crypto uh, and then i went for a haircut the other day and my barber said it looks good i was bro. i was really it into looks crypto. good <laughs> thank you i was really into crypto last year or sorry in the last bull market but um because suddenly like my uh my my landlord had come in and said you know we we're cutting down the rates and the government came in and said oh here's a grant for your business so that you can get your business you know 
performing better and all these things. And I was like, okay, this is interesting because that's how liquidity entered the market. And he's like, right now I can't afford to enter crypto because I don't really have much money because my rents are high and there's not much like money coming in from the government. So I was like, okay, maybe that's what it looks like. Because in the last bull market, he took his liquidity and shoved it straight into crypto. So it all kind of works out rather perfectly. And there's a great, uh, a great model to pay attention to on cross-border capital. Um, that kind of, you know, shows a, a really kind of great, um, a great chart of how it kind of runs through. And it does feel, you know, throughout last year where people were like trying to worry about this chart and maybe we're a bit early and maybe all these things, everything kind of learned up perfectly with just the increase in, in capital flooding in. We moved towards the U.S. election at the end of the year. So the U.S. obviously capital is going to flood into the market because it makes the government look like they're doing a better job than maybe they've been doing. No comments on that. Uh, and then that happens in sort of various places. So as far as I'm concerned, you know, the halving is maybe the kind of the thing that's used to kind of get the media hype and attention during this period of the market, whereas we transition from the smart money into the like uh, the, the hype media um, public adoption phase. Um, and obviously, you know, on paper, it sounds like maybe it's going to have a bit of an impact. But I think that the underlying... Uh, the underlying kind of liquidity moves are what's driving it. So yeah, it's an, an interesting, so, an interesting concept. But I think it's gonna. Sorry, I think it's gonna come in. I think when it does, you know, launch, it's it's the perfect catalyst, like the piece of news that gets, you know, floated out across all of Bloomberg and CNN or whatever, and and that's when everyone starts to ape in, being like, oh, you know, every time it's the Harvey, Bitcoin blows up. So yeah. I think I think what we're all saying here is that we're very early in the cycle, and that the the there's still I mean we, I, when I listen to everybody, everybody kind of believes that there's still another year at least in the cycle, and I'm always worried about what everybody thinks because if everybody just thinks the cycle is going to go on and on and on, then the point of max pain, which is where markets tend to get to, is that you know the markets the cycles get cut short. I mean, is that a concern for any of you? Like, are any of you concerned that this market may just get cut really short and? It does feel toppy now. You've got meme coins exploding. You've got altcoins exploding every single day. Now, I know we haven't had a very long bull market, but is there anyone here that maybe thinks that the cycle may be short and maybe could be close to topping? I, I personally think that um, I, I, I'm very wary of, <laughs> I, I'm very wary to take like any prolonged bull market projections um, as a given, um, especially because of how much uh, altcoins are emitting. Like the, the altcoin market cap is roughly almost uh, like 800 billion, depending on which altcoins you want to you know include, and it's already emitted 17 billion dollars of uh, supply um, over the past three months, um, which is roughly as much as you know has been inflowed into the Bitcoin ETFs. So like if you presume that people are selling Bitcoin to buy these altcoins, then like we're right now at a neutral level despite having you know, historic levels of flows. Like the question is like. I mean, obviously, all these uh, supply inflations don't, don't get sold immediately. But the question is, like, when these guys do decide to sell, like, how low do they take it? And how much does it affect, like, the broader market? So uh, that's something that I'm, you know, wary of. So these unlocks... When who decides to sell, you're referring to, like, the unlocks? Yes. Yeah, unlocks, staking reward inflation, and any increase in the supply. So when I yeah. look at this, when I look at this, on the one hand, uh, on the one hand, it is... Uh, um, uh, unlocks and it, it is uh, people selling. But on the other hand, it is more liquidity in the market. So on the one hand, yes, it is unlocks and 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 more stuff becoming unlocked. But on the other hand, this is liquidity that ordinarily wasn't in the market that may migrate into other altcoins. So it could be a rotation from one narrative to another narrative, so to speak. So, you know, like if you think about where these unlocks are coming from, it's people that are locked up in in potentially narratives that were. Uh, you know, you bought something which sounded like a good idea at the time. Now these unlocks are two years later. Um, you dump the unlocks, you put that money into into other things. Um, so, um, I, I mean, I, I see the point that you're saying that we've got like an inflation or you, that you've got like a, a, a more tokens on the market. But on the other hand, you also have more liquidity on the market. Yeah, I think you're precisely right, Rand. I don't, I don't think a lot of it just gets rotated within and a lot of it doesn't get sold. Like, you know, for example, two billion of it is just Solana staking rewards. And like a lot of these staking operators don't sell, they just continue accruing Solana because they believe in Solana. The whole point is that like there's been 17 billion of like unrealized profits or just value created out of nowhere in the past three months. And, you know, the, the time that these guys decide to sell is very sort of um, 
it's very behavioral. It's like when things look like they're at the over, everyone decides to sell at the same time. And that's when like it just crashes everything and overwhelms liquidity. And that's something that like we always have to be wary of uh, learning from previous cycles. Sure. So, so yeah. how does that, with w- w- that thesis, how does that change your investment narrative? So like when you look at that, how does it make a difference in, in how you look at investments? Do you, does that mean that you're, you're scared to take long, long vesting positions? Does that mean that you're, you're like, well, how do you, how does this thesis change your investment landscape? Yeah, I, I think that like new tokens, especially new narratives will do especially well. So like in terms of investing in newer promising projects, that hasn't really affected it that much. All I think it does affect for me is like the dispersion of assets. I think like older things that like don't have as much of a narrative that are still like just, you know, huge and constantly emitting will like underperform. Whereas like new crypto tokens that have, you know, promising new narratives will continue to do well as long as, you know, Bitcoin and ETH, the broader market just as well. Okay, so then that maybe kicks us into discussion around narratives. And that's something that I want to talk to you guys about. We had a very strong Bitcoin narrative. I think that Bitcoin narrative is probably done. I saw that yesterday, just before I just before I left the office yesterday, I saw Vitalik actually tweeted something. He said something about uh, Vitalik's post, what's next for Ethereum? After proof of search, he said, uh, he said built directly on L2s, not on L1s, pr- protect privacy by default versus public ETH mainnet. anti sybil should include centralized solutions, move to account abstraction wallets, prove your participation beyond balance of your ETH holdings. So I think the, I think the big question is here, is there going to be an ETH narrative? What's your bet around an ETH ETF? I'm quite bearish around an ETH ETF on, in May. I don't see an ETH ETF happening in May. What's, how do you guys feel about the whole ETH narrative? Uh, Jose, let's start with you on this one. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm bullish ETH. Um, yeah, I don't think, again, I, I don't have any special insight on this other than reading you know, smart people on it. I don't think the ETF is gonna gonna happen in May, and I, I think that's almost like more bullish, honestly, for for the for the entire market. Uh, I, th- I think otherwise the the sort of whatever they call it, the left translated cycle would, would be much more likely. I think with a with an ETF delay, you have a lot more time for people to to speculate and and and, and project out. Um, and yeah, I think I think ETH is like super underrated, um, like right now, like under owned. Um, I still think it's it's in a it's kind of like in a in a, in a privileged position. Uh, you're sort of seeing, I, and again, like when I came on your show for the last like 18 months, pretty much Solana was my main bet, right? That I talked about in terms of in terms of liquid tokens, um, and I'm still bullish Solana. But I do think you're starting to see like the L2 narrative also arrive on Solana, right? Like the the Drip founder was mentioning like wanting their own L2, their own execution environment, uh, customizability. And I think all those all those reasons um, are like still apply, and so I think Solana, if Solana ends up in the same with the same sort of final architecture as Ethereum, then it's it does sort of validate a lot of um, it, it does then make sense like why not why not have the most decentralized settlement layer, the most Lindy settlement layer where you actually have the most value locked, um, and yeah, like the the problems Ethereum is having in terms of like or the so called problems are just like problems of being the winner, right? Like ETH L1 is, is too congested. Definitely there was bad design design choices made. All the activities moving to L2s, but settlement is still like, uh, I think ETH's sort of use case is, is, is settlement and then like being this store value asset for the entire ETH ecosystem. Um, and yeah, I think like once Wall Street get, gets, a, gets wind of like the staking, like ETH has a yield, um, it's not, it's, it's, um, you know, it doesn't harm the environment with proof of stake and it's like actually deflationary from or, or you know, mostly deflationary from fundamentals. Uh, I just think it's the the narrative that, that Larry Fink can can spin around this, especially with already like starting to settle things with BlackRock on, on, on Ethereum and stuff like that. And realistically, any of those RWA use cases are going to go to Ethereum because because there's no career risk going to Ethereum. Right. It's 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 just like um, it's, it's the most Lindy. It's it's survived like many upgrades. It has never halted, um, and and so yeah, I think it's I think Ethereum's in a is in a pretty good spot. I mean, this chart disagrees with you. I'm just going to show you the, the 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 chart, the ETH BTC chart. It's uh, not yeah. not, look, not looking good, Brev. It's not not looking good, Brev. 
Uh, Thicky, what's your yeah. what's your what's your thoughts here on on the ETH BTC chart and ETH as a narrative? Pete, I'm coming to you next, sir. Yeah, I, I've been bearish ETH BTC and bearish the odds of an ETH ETF in May for a long time, and I think you know Wednesday's Coinbase case sort of sealed the deal. Uh, in my mind, I think it's going to be very, very unlikely in May. Um, and in the meantime, with Bitcoin receiving these flows and ETH sort of getting its like, uh, you know, the casino narrative of ETH getting eaten away by soul, I, I think, you know, they're going to try to defend the 0.05 level on ETH BTC for a little bit, but ultimately it'll settle lower at like 0.045, maybe even 0.04. Uh, I think in a long term perspective, I'm still very bullish ETH. Um, I think it's good, at least for my investment horizon, that. Um, the ETTF might get delayed past a year. Um, and I think eventually ETH will go to 10K. And I think it is a superior store value to Bitcoin. I just like temporarily, it's not in a good spot. It's sort of like stuck in the mid curve, I guess. Would you is. be buying it now? Because you want to buy tokens when they're not in a good spot. So the question is, would if I gave you if I gave you $10,000 now and I said invest it, would you put it into Bitcoin or ETH? I would still put it into Bitcoin. Like even though the ETHBTC ratio is low, like ETH at 35 is... Still, in my mind, like quite high for where the market is. Um, it might not matter in a year or two, but like maybe it's just ego speaking. But I think I can time it better and catch it lower. Pete, if I gave you ten thousand dollars, Bitcoin or Ether, and why? Um, Bitcoin. Um, I think mainly paying attention to the Sol ETH chart is is kind of an interesting place to look right now. Sol's pretty much just about to break through all time highs against ETH. Um, and it, you know, previously we've always looked at the model of like, you know, it's a Bitcoin, the path to altcoin season goes Bitcoin, Ethereum, and then everything else. But it, it's quite clearly maybe Sol's now replaced Ethereum in that kind of, in that marching order right now. Uh, with the rise of like um, D-PIN, uh, which is mainly kind of going towards Solana uh, and lots of kind of other projects that are trying to going towards Solana. We've also seen a huge kind of boom on memes and things like that. Ethereum... Every time it's kind of like moving towards these kind of upgrades and everyone thinks, oh, yeah, it's going to be fine because it's got the promise of this upgrade going on and then it happens and then it never really kind of delivers. I don't know. I feel like people are still choosing other options and then there's only going to be more and more options coming through. I feel like people are going to, the, the flow of new new development going on on Ethereum is probably not going to be there. So if I was choosing between Bitcoin and Ethereum, then yeah, I'd go Bitcoin. Okay, what about the other blockchains? What about, for example, Move? I read this tweet from Chris Benes. He said EVM, SVM, and MVM, and now we're starting to see the Move blockchains actually get some real traction. Sui's got their, uh, their I don't know if it's their first DevCon, but they've got the DevCon coming up in, in, in uh, Paris in, in April. Um, how bullish are you guys on the Move blockchains? Aptos, Sui, and uh, you know anything else that's being developed with Move? Jose, let's start with you, sir. Yeah, um, I mean, move. Yeah, I don't know. To be honest, I think I think it's it's clearly uh, a better, like a better dev framework. Like sort of all of our devs that have that have moved to move to move um, have said have said that. Like they really really enjoy building it. It enables actually like new use cases and and stuff like that. Um, I just don't know if that's enough because you you sort of like even if it is a better dev framework, you still have the trade off of like learning a new language versus being able to build in, in Rust, right? And benefiting from all the from all the tooling that already exists for, for Rust, for, for Solana, for Cosmos and stuff like this. And I just don't know. I also think like the teams behind the ecosystems have been pretty boomer about their like ecosystem development strategies and kind of historically dismissive of, you know, you, you kind of have this, uh, this and, and again, like, um, the, I don't want to hate on those those teams because they're clearly super smart people. But you have this trend of teams that come in either like especially professor coins uh, or, or you know people that come from 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 Silicon Valley and they come in and they're like uh, everything that's been done so far is just is just stupid. It's just all like silly games. We're going to be the serious blockchain, right? And try and make do partnerships with the, with the big companies and have like real stuff happening. And I think that is has historically never worked, and I don't think it will work. I think you have to start with the users that are here now, who are like on-chain degens, right? Of, of I mean, all types. Like, look, you, yeah. If I look at the wormhole uh, uh, money flows, I mean, Sui's got seven hundred million total value locked. The last time I looked this week, 
Um, they clearly yeah, do have done a much better job than Aptos. Yeah, uh, and, they, and I think like, it's better tech. Yeah, there's clearly something also. going on there. There's clearly something going on there. And then or every user that, I, that 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 uses Sui, including ourselves, it's just the best experience ever. Actually, to be honest, it's it's a it's a nicer experience to use than Solana. It's smoother. Solana is great, but I think Sui, when I use it, it's it's a it's a it's a much better experience. Now, surely that's got to count for something. Like surely that, that's got to count for something. Also, you mentioned that Move is a, a new language. Move is a derivative of Rust. Like it's 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 not mm-hmm. very different from Rust. Yes, you have to learn new things, but from what I understand, from a, for a developer to migrate from Rust to Move is not a not a big thing, not a big uh, a thing. I mean, apparently they can do it like in a weekend or something. So I mean, look, I I was quite Solana wins everything. Seeing Aptos and Sui, you know, I put some chips down on Sui just because it looks like Sui might be doing some of the right noises. Thicky, what do you think, sir? Yeah, I have some Sui too. I agree with you just as but I agree with you on on Sui, and I think they're they're doing the best job out of the out of the two for sure on ecosystem development. Yeah. yeah sorry, go ahead, Thicky. Thicky, sorry. Yeah, no worries. Um, I'm a little annoyed because I, I tried to rotate into the move ecosystem quite early, like November of last year, and it was very unsuccessful. And now it's just now that it's catching up, especially with salon success. Um, I, I I'm personally with Jose's camp where I, I feel like. Um, they don't, it, it, it is an improvement over Solana, but it's like, doesn't offer enough of an improvement to like warrant people migrating over. I, I haven't used Sui as much as you have, so maybe my experience there is different. Um, but I, I think it's like slightly better, but not better enough. Um, but you know, at the current valuations are like 20 billion versus Solana at a hundred. It's like, you know, if they're pricing in, you know, a one fifth percent, you know, probability that it overtakes Solana or something like that. And it's hard to argue that it, that isn't fair. Pete, what do you think, sir? I mean, like like uh, like Sikis just said, like unless there's really a significant shift, a significant benefit in using one over the other, I think people are going to mainly focus on staying staying in their lane. Like Solana's already offering pretty much everything everything that they're looking for. Um, everyone, I mean, everyone else is uh, my hair's on firing this crypto bull market right now. I'm sure everyone else is either. People are focusing on kind of like building building and developing their projects right now and having to add another thing such as migrating to other chains and things like that, unless it's sort of an essential thing or something that's really going to really add benefit. I can't see many people doing it. All right. I, I don't think a chain can win by like, uh, first of all, I don't think the usability uh, it's, it's important, but the main thing is like devs are the leading indicator, right? Like devs building cool stuff on the chain because devs build the applications that kind of like bring in users. Um, and you, you are seeing some, uh, smart devs building like cool stuff on 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 Sui. Um, I just think that th- you you haven't seen enough stuff that can't be built on on Solana. Uh, but yeah, among the like the monolith narrative, I'd say Sui is definitely like really well positioned. And I also think having your own language is is an advantage versus launching with EVM uh, to some extent because it forces you to actually build out your own ecosystem versus just attracting teams that end up doing forks or, or, or whatever else. Like teams that have their own language have it harder at first, but then the, the teams are much stickier. The teams you attract are much stickier uh, and you actually build like differentiated ecosystems, right? Like, and this didn't happen with, for instance, like AVAX to, to the same extent because they had Aave there from the beginning and stuff. And I do I do believe new chains should have, have like this protectionist, like emerging market protectionist approach where you want to protect, uh, you, you actually want to make sure that you have like, um, the the your own projects like basically i think a new chain wins by the amount of opportunities it gives its users to get rich and that means having as many projects as possible launching tokens that have the potential to to do well and yeah and I think the project is, is leading aptos by a lot there yeah i mean see we did do a partnership with the baby shark game i don't know the baby shark song and they're starting a baby shark game metaverse that, that's big i mean you laugh but baby shark has the most views out of any uh, number one Number one out of it's got 13 billion views or something. It's like something ridiculous yeah, like yeah. that. All right, so not that bullish. I mean bullish, but not that bullish on on the move narrative. Let's talk about other narratives that you guys are actually bullish on. And I'm gonna like this is where you guys tell me what you guys are looking at and wh- where you're putting your money down. Um, I, I've got one in mind, but I, I'm gonna again I'm gonna hand it over to to uh, to, to Thicky because he's new. He's new to the channel. Thicky, you want to get you want to get into how you think. Uh, some narratives that you're extremely bullish on. Yeah, for sure. I, I'm very bullish on like D-PIN, specifically like AI D-PIN. Um, there are a lot of projects uh, building on Solana that I think I'm very excited about. Um, 
specifically like, you know, decentralized networks that will address sort of like future regulatory problems. So for example, like if AI gets regulated, if like training a model or running inference on a model becomes like, you know, very regulated, like for example, like maybe the government wants to ban AI girlfriends from happening to like, you know, not just kill the birth rate. Um, then like having a um, sort of decentralized network that you can do whatever you want on uh, will be very important in the future. So that's one area that like I'm particularly excited about. And any specific yeah. projects that you're bullish on in that area? Uh, it's disclosed that I'm an investor in it, but I, I'm really bullish on IONET. That's yeah. launching on Solana in uh, April next nice. month. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, we had an AI show here last week, and the guy spoke about the distributed GPU problem, which is one of the games that one of the things that Ionet's doing. And I mean, I've been really bullish this distributed GPU problem. And they said, look, yeah, it's great, but what happens when they solve the distributed G when they solve the GPU problem? All of a sudden, there's no supply. Now, Ionet does have an advantage because Ionet's got that whole software layer above, which is actually where the IP actually lies, right? But what happens to all the other distributed GPU players? And there are many of those GPU players. Do you guys have a view on like what happens if, or, or, or do we need to worry about what happens if this GPU problem solves it, sorts itself out? Does that mean that protocols like render, GPU.net, uh, Nosana, uh, and all those just basically don't have any value anymore? Pete, interested to hear your view because I know you've been bullish. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's a very, it's a very, interesting topic obviously like uh the demand is absolutely crazy within that space and one of the things i found quite interesting there was a very big big node sale recently for a project called Ether, Aether, which Aether, obviously, yeah. Aether, yeah yeah and um this is this is like a great project similar similar in a way to io.net but kind of focusing perhaps a bit more towards the kind of cloud gaming and things like cloud phone they've got this project called a phone which is really cool um but a lot of what the how the network was working they had like distributed new distributed nodes and things like that so following the decentralized model and then basically the checker nodes which were for sale are then kind of like you can either run them on your computer or if you don't want to run your computer all the time you can go and run them on aws which is a centralized service so it's kind of like you run all your nodes and put them in a centralized location well done you've uh, just decentralized yeah. you've just centralized a decentralized <laughs> network congratulations <laughs> Yeah, so basically just, you know, completely like moving back against, you know, what the original plan was. Um, it means, well, you're, what you're saying is that, yeah, there's a potential that they could be outcompeted for. But but at the moment, because the demand for large language model training is, I believe, doing, this is from the Masari deep in report at the end of last year, um, doing something like a 10x every 18 months. And the supply is something like a 2x every 18 months. So the demand's going absolutely through the roof and there's no no possible way to cope with that scale of demand at the moment. Um, so it does look like, you know, whether whether there's like down the line, other kind of competition rolls in and things like that. I think, you know, all these all these projects, they're, they're not even competing with each other because there's so much demand. They can just kind of go out to market and they're all kind of like- I'm worried that know, they- I'm, AI worried, I'm not worried that they're competing with each other. I'm worried that they're competing with NVIDIA and NVIDIA may just release a whole lot of GPUs or, or whatever, or someone else may just release a whole lot of GPUs. And then I'm, I'm kind of worried for the whole sector. I'm not worried for the, you know, Ionet versus GPU.net or I'm not worried mm. about that. that. That game I'm not worried about. What I'm worried about is that they okay, solve the GPU problem. Got you. Okay, so yeah, but they're holding. So then, so basically, they're using Nvidia's GPUs and distributing, um, and distributing that network to various different users. And it's overcoming a certain problem, which is to do with the latency and to do with the demand, um, the demand timing on it. For example, you know, you might have some stuff to do this week. You have a huge demand on, and then at the weekend you stop using it, and therefore you're kind of pricing during the week, etc. It's expensive. At the weekend, you may be not using it. Uh, and then by using this kind of distributed model, it allows for kind of less downtime. It makes it much more efficient for NVIDIA because they can use less, uh, they have to use less kind of GPUs um, within these sort of different areas because they can feed them into the network. So it's much more efficient effectively to be able to, so. to use when there's a demand uh and sort of get your power from different places it's the same as like it, i sort of think about it simply as like if you've got like a windmill in the back garden and you've got your power and you know through the day when you've got your tv and your kettle on and things you know you need all the power but at night time 
you can feed it back I to see. the grid. Yeah. So it's kind of like, that's the way I think of it. Yeah, I mean, I actually saw a project uh, the other day, and I'm going to mention them that they, they were one of the projects that actually donated money to our banter bags. And I know a lot of you guys don't know what the banter bags are, but that's where we give away, we put $1,000 worth of IDO allocations into the banter bags. And then when we get to a million subscribers on banter, 350,000 subscribers on banter plus, we give it away to the community. There's a project called Gaming. Gaming is, what they've done is they've tapped into uh, gaming computers to use their spare GPUs for computational tasks. And they, they, they claim that they have, or they're going to have the biggest a computer network or the, the biggest gaming computer network in the world. So yeah, that's, that is one that's pretty interesting. They gave us the allocation at a $250 million fully diluted and now it's trading at $2 billion. So we've got an ATEX uh, into the banter bags. Uh, Jose, I'm looking at you, sir. Narrative that you're interested in. And I think I know what you're going to say and I think yeah. I'm ready for it. I think I'm ready for it. I think I'm ready to click it as soon as you say it. So. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm Athena is my... Is is uh, you you expecting Astro or what? No 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 sir. I mean I'm, I've been ready for you. I've been as you can see I've been ready for you sir. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there it is. <laughs> yeah, I mean it is my is maybe my highest conviction bag from our from our ventures portfolio. Uh, we did we did every round. I've also bought like I've been farming it personally and doing the YT. So full disclosure, very very invested. Why are you so but bullish yeah, on this thing? That, just just walk me through. Dumb it down for me and explain it to me like I'm five, why you're so bullish on Athena. Um, yeah, I still think stable coins are crypto's killer app, uh, or at least one of them. And the market has shown that it wants yield on stable coins. And I think Athena will be the highest yield available at scale on, on stable coins for How the do they, future. For those that and don't so know. So it's just going to absorb... Mm -hmm. For those that don't know, how do they achieve such a high yield? Because the minute that you say high yield, the default goes into Anchor Protocol 20% through emissions, and then everyone gets the shivers and gets hives and severe allergies to, to, to the protocol. So maybe just for those who are not as in touch with everyone else, maybe just walk us through how Athena actually achieves such high yields. Yeah. So Athena basically does this... Um, yeah. The, the, it does this basis trade, which effectively what you do is you put in some capital, so like ETH, right? Um, and it's held in a, in this in this off chain like MPC wallet, and then you open uh, a short ETH position on the exchange, right? Of the, the same size, and so effectively um, you're you're now delta neutral. You're 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 you have a dollar exposure, and you collect the funding rate plus the the yield on the staked ETH because they're actually using staked ETH as collateral, and so. In general, both legs of the position provide a yield. Um, it's 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 a variant of Arthur Hayes' original idea of a, of a synthetic U.S. dollar. Um, and and yeah, like historically, um, even in the in the last three years, like taking into account, you know, one of the longest bear markets we've ever had, um, eighty percent of days have 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 featured like positive funding. Um, and there's never been, I think, more than sort of twenty one days straight of of of, of negative funding. Um, and yeah, like with Athena's case, it doesn't just have to be negative funding, right? It has to be negative funding that that overtakes um, the the staked ETH yield that they're getting on the on the collateral. Yeah, so I mean, st um, statistically, yeah. statistically, uh, statistically, the Athena model actually works. What are the risks to the Athena model? When does the Athena model Bitcoin. collapse? And and if it collapses, does it go down to like like a Luna? Because again. I mean, I, I, I understand it, but I think a lot of people, when I try and explain it to them, immediately they're going to default yeah. Terra Luna mode. Yeah. Um, so it's very different than Terra Luna. It's, it's, it's like fully collateralized. So, and it has actually like, in my opinion, the opposite of, in terms of it has, it has uh, like no reflexivity, like anti-reflexivity built in. And so the most common FUD people talk about is funding risk, right? What happens if funding flips negative for prolonged periods, do we see like this UST like blow up? Um, and in addition to the response that like funding has, has been highly positive historically, which the, the other thing that's worth noting is they have an insurance fund, which covers periods of negative funding, which basically means that um, if if funding is, is negative below the ETH staking rate, they cover the, the negative yield from, from the insurance fund, right? And that's, I believe, at around 25 million right now. Um, and then but we'll, conti but but we'll continue where, to, we'll continue to go. Scenario, we'll continue to so, but, but let's say a worst case scenario where, 
um, like the funding is, is is highly negative and it's negative for long enough that it, that it literally drains the entire uh, in, insurance fund. So in this case, USD is still uh, fully externally collect, uh, collateralized, right? Um, and so you end up having like um, a situation where like it, it's the opposite of, of what would happen with Luna. Rather than a violent uh, contraction, you have like a prolonged, slow um, erosion of the capital because so in the case that funding yields are negative, what you have is the principal balance of the stable coin erodes over time below a dollar funding pay because the funding payments are made out of the collateral balance, right? And this sounds bad, but the risk is very different than Luna where it's a violent collapse to zero. Um, because if you think about the max negative funding rate on Binance, which is like negative 100%, I believe, that's a loss of 0.273% per day, right? And, and, just, and just to be clear, that, rate, that never happens. I mean, like that... In the yeah. history of, of of coins, that doesn't happen. You get very positive. Yeah. Uh, uh, you get positive funding rates that have been happening recently, but negative funding rates, even in the worst of corrections, don't last very long. And and even in that case, like what happens is, you know, people are, are incentivized to redeem the stablecoin, right? Because they're basically losing capital every day. And when they redeem the stablecoin, so the yield goes negative. People redeem the stablecoin. Athena unwinds the shorts. And the funding should mean revert like back above zero over time, right? Find an equilibrium like back above zero. And, yeah. and the biggest worry is that like a lot of people redeem at the same time, and basically you get bad execution on the on the on, on unwinding the shorts. But I, I just personally think like even in a worst case scenario with that, you're not gonna see like a massive haircut. I agree. Um, I agree. And it's I'm... the opposite of an algo stable, right? Where redemption in an algo stable, redemption tanks the price of the share token, the collateral token. And starts creating this positive feedback loop, the debt spiral, mm -hmm. right? Like collateral token goes down, people get scared, they redeem more UST, collateral token goes down more. Um, yeah. And, and I mean, here's I, like I th sort of the I th opposite. I think the fact that it's 100% collateralized, that and and that's an on-chain, I mean, you're watching that on the, you have the addresses and you mm -hmm. can see it in the wallet. I think that should give people uh, peace of mind. Uh, we're also investors, full disclosure. We are investors in Athena, so very excited about it. Uh, it's not our biggest bag, uh, and it's not our biggest conviction bag, but it's certainly something we have a lot of conviction in. Siki, I'm coming back to you, sir, because uh, we want more narratives from you, sir. We don't know you yet. You know, we feel like we know Pete and we know Jose because they've been here before, but, you know, we feel like a, like you're a stranger. So uh, trying to get more of what you're interested in. <coughs> yeah. Um, let me think. I'm going to pull up my investment uh sheets <laughs> invested in. I, I really what i would do what i would do to get a copy of that sheet bro what i would do to just get a copy of that that investment sheet that you're looking at now <laughs> i think that people I'll, in the I'll audience the, zooming into your eyeballs now on a very 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 high <laughs> thing just to see reflection. to see for the reflection what that sheet looks like <laughs> that's funny um i mean obviously i'm very bullish athena as well it's it's i'm actually kind of annoyed that they're launching at such a scale because it's been one of the best kept sort of funds slash liquid trading secrets. Um, it's just like a free 30% on your capital uh, annualized. Um, and more on YT, right? Like the yield token was really like an insane trade. Like from the beginning of the month when the Pendle yield token launched, I think it's up like 10x. Um, Are you serious? I did not know that. Yeah, That's because cool. you, like YT was trading at basically five cents, like four to five cents. So, you know, um, one dollar of of capital gets you like 20 to 25 YT and then you're generating 10 X points on that. So basically 250 X, 200 to 250 X leverage on points and points are now trading at 0. 0.0015. So if you do the maths on how much you would have generated from buying YT, like at the beginning of the month, it, it's like eight to 10 X, which is, wow. it's pretty wild. It was mm. like a, yeah, an insane trade. Sick trade, yeah. uh, I want to move past uh, Athena absolutely. as much as we all love it. I do. I mean, we've got limited time, and we, we're trying to squeeze Alpha. I'm trying to make as much juice in with by squeezing the the the, the lemon here. So, next narrative, please, sir. Yeah, um, I, I'm super bullish on Monad, um, especially you know with Solana eating Ethereum's launch on the consumer side. Like seeing a parallelized version of the EVM <laughs> that will hopefully like increase. TPS and like scale, um, you know, consumer facing side more is something that's very bullish to me. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, we, we yeah, I, I, we are bullish on Monet. I must say that I was quite disappointed with the team. We were invest, we were promised an investment in the round, and then for some reason at the end they they booted us. 
So I've got like negative vibes towards them, to be honest. But I do, I do think that, <laughs> oh, no, no, I mean, we, I mean, we were down the road, we were, we were getting us out and then all of a sudden, sorry guys, we were oversubscribed and I'm just like, really? Uh, but yeah, I mean, I must say, I must take my head off them. Uh, Monad, Paralyzed, EVM, uh, coming out, I think test, I think launch is what, Q3 or something? Q2, Q3? Q3, Q4, I think. Q3, Q4. <laughs> Pete, back to you. Then I'm coming to you, Jose. Then I'm coming back to you, Thicky. So be ready, sir. I know what I you're going to say. I know what 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 you're going to say. Go ICP. On. ICP. What? I I ICP. No. No. Okay. I, I was actually so you posted you you posted or reposted something the other day which was really interesting. Uh, Dominic Williams. I always get his name wrong. But Dominic Williams talking about um, the blockchain being used uh, and demonstrating the AI model. That was really cool. Yeah, I think. So look, I, do, I, I am bullish ICP. I'm long ICP. I wasn't bullish last bull market. Uh, I dumped all my ICP last bull market, and I went and bought it back more expensive this bull market. Um, yeah, but keen to hear your your narrative. ICP does bring a very interesting point. It's not there's not going to be ICP, but let me just use ICP as the example since you brought it up. Now, ICP, I don't you must have realized has has kind of brought up and some some unknown reason caught the attention of many people and is one of the most hyped up and exciting things that people talk about on YouTube. Um, yes. For whatever reason. Um, <laughs> but that's a very big part of, of kind of crypto as a whole. I know not necessarily for like the purists and things, but I think there's like a, a definitely an element of the excitement and the ability for a community to kind of understand something and get behind it that drives narrative forwards. And that's why I think in the last bull market, we saw GameFi being such like, Easy. Uh, an explosive easy. thing because easy to understand. it's very easy for people to kind of yeah to know what's going on like bright pretty colors like big names we've all played video games at some point in our lives whether we play them now or not um they're very easy to kind of get on board with so games and where we see crossovers with with things like deep in and crossovers between particular narratives like you mentioned earlier with gaming Mm -hmm. I think is is very very bullish and things to pay attention to. Literally, you uh, you also mentioned earlier talking gaming. Literally yesterday, I believe they partnered up with uh, with Aether. Yes. So they've partnered up with Aether, which is uh, yeah integrating with Aether, which is obviously a very exciting exciting move. Um, I mean, I've been I've been looking at Aether for a while now, which helps. You know, I've known I've known the CEO. CEO for a long time. I used to play rugby with him back in the day. So I love gaming. I love gaming. Kind of pick his ears and pick I love his ears, pick his, uh, pick his brain. Sorry, what is this? Pick his brain about um, about the kind of the world of deep in and things like that. But um, yeah. So gaming. I think when you have these crossovers, another thing outside of kind of deep in and gaming and within the kind of AI area is that of AI agents. Um, yes, which I think are kind of the the end. You know, you start with the kind of the deep end part, and then this is the kind of the front end side of things that people are going to be dealing with. And I've been looking into one project in particular called Delisium, um, which has been running really quite well uh, over the last few months, having a quite a decent pullback in the last kind of few weeks, which makes it kind of more reasonable as far as I'm looking at it right now. Other other key AI agents uh, are coming about all the time but the ai agent effectively is is using the large language model information and it's kind of interacting with the user and 90 i believe 98 percent of businesses questioned by forbes were anticipating that they would be using ai agents within the next couple of years the the growth span potential is pretty incredible the us or there's models that suggest yeah, I mean, the us na the narrative the narrative strong the narrative like strong the narrative strong i mean you can't you can't decline this narrative you can't fade the narrative, so you yeah. can't fade the narrative. Jose, back to you, sir. We've got uh, six minutes left, sir. So you, you got, and then we're going back to you, Thicky. So, Jose, another narrative that you're super bullish on. Um, yeah, I don't have any off the top of my head, honestly. I, I've, I couldn't, yeah, ICP is a blast from the past. Just remember that awkward YouTube video. But yeah, maybe the, I mean, I, I do think AI, AI coins, crypto XAI in general is going to be, is going to be a huge narrative. You guys talked about decentralized GPU, but I think there's a bunch of, other parts of that narrative, like the identity piece, I think is going to be huge. Like you see Worldcoin trading is like Sam Altman beta at, at hundred bill. That's a massive bounty basically for any team to come in and, and build alternatives to that. We've seen a few already. Um, I think decentralized training, decentralized inference, like there's teams building cool stuff in, in all of this. 
Um, yeah, I took I, a, I, think crypto- I took a position this week in a token called Based AI. Um, initially, I thought it was a lot of hype, and then I spoke to the devs of this project. Um, it is like a br- an AI brain with multiple subchains underneath, which all do AI computation. Ultimately, it all feeds into the the the, the based brain. These guys were one of the smartest teams that I've ever spoken to. And I think also this week, we saw the merger between, I don't know if it's a merger, but it, it is a merger between Fetch AI, uh, Singularity and Ocean Protocol. So definitely, definitely things happening in the AI narrative. And I, you can't fade it because even if you want to fade it for as long as headlines in the TradFi space revolve around AI, crypto will get the sympathy pump, uh, like it or not. It's just like when I was watching Larry Fink speak the other day, um, and I was watching them. It was crazy. I was watching him speak on CNBC and I was watching the, and Fox, sorry. And I was watching the BlackRock meme coin and the BlackRock meme coin was, was pumping. And so one of the guys in the office actually owns a whole lot of BlackRock meme coin. I said to him, not one day you're going to tell your kids how you paid for the university. You're going to say, I invested in BlackRock. Just don't tell them it was the meme coin. Just, just say kids, I invested in BlackRock. That's all it is. The fact that it's a meme coin, who cares? But I mean, what I'm trying to say is that Crypto acts like a meme coin, and when the narrative runs in TradFi, the narrative's going to run in crypto like the meme coin run. And that's you just you, in a bull market, you just have to take that momentum bet. There's, it's just the, the best way to do it. Um, before I jump yeah, to thinking, the momentum of, uh, before I jump to any 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 AI plays that you're bullish on specifically. Yes, we lost you. I mean, Sorry, that's quite. Do they have to have a, a token trading uh, publicly? They don't have to, but we'd prefer it. But I mean, you know, we're DJs. We like okay. to press the buy button as you speak. But I mean, yes. if yes. Okay, this one doesn't have a token trading, but it does have a points uh, system. I think Grass is, yes, is get grass. super interesting. Like, the, yeah, exactly. De- decentralizing the data. I think those points are going to... Just maybe uh, quickly yeah. again, because it's not a listed project. A lot of people don't know about it. Maybe just in two sentences, just sum up what Grass actually does. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that I'd be the, the best person to, to do it justice, but it, it's basically tackling, like, if you think about the AI stack, uh, it, it's tackling the data portion of that, like decentralizing data collection, um, for, for, for AI with this, like, um, play to earn effectively or, or model. If it, yeah, effectively, um, what yeah. it does is it incentivizes users to part with data through a play to earn model. I think that's probably the best, the simple explanation of it. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I'm coming back yep. to you, and then we're going to call it a day. Uh, what are we? What are you? What, what, one more narrative that you're bullish on, and I'm going to squeeze you for some coins in that narrative. Okay, sounds good. I'll, I'll do you one better. I'll give you, I'll give you uh, three. Um, I, I think for uh, like, I, I think like cross chain, um, like bridging and communication will be like a narrative, especially with the wormhole launch and then layer zero later this year. Um, one project that I'm invested in that I'm very bullish on is called Holograph, which is like. Uh, sort of omni-chain tokens, like they're just all fungible and they can all interact with each other. I think like, especially when, as like sexes get more uh, regulated, it's gonna be more of a prescient need to be able to transact in a decentralized way, like is this, cross-chain. Is this so, fulfilling the same use case as, for example, a layer zero or a, or a Stargate where you can transact across any network? Is it is it similar? This, uh, this app is built on top of layer zero. Okay. Um, yeah, it just like wraps these tokens that you can like transfer them cross chain uh, seamlessly. What about if any of you come across Zeta Chain, Z E T A Chain? So I, I mean, I've read a lot about it, and to me, when I read, I haven't done managed to do a tech due diligence on it, and the valuation was quite high for me to enter. But when I looked at it, I kind of thought like, if this chain does what it says it does, and it allows you to do cross chain uh, smart contracts and and cross chain swaps, uh, and so seamlessly. The reason why I didn't look at it, it's got a $4 billion fully diluted valuation. And at $4 billion, I, don't, I just don't see the upside. I don't see, I don't see why I should waste time on it. But I mean, I mean, has anyone looked at it? Okay, so I guess not. I looked at it briefly. I looked at it. I, 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 I technically am an investor in this as well. Oh, okay. And so you must be pretty bullish. Zeta, we have a great report on that, on the Delphi portal, actually. And what, yeah. what, what's, what are your thoughts? And what's the, the TLDR? Um... Yeah, again, I, I don't. I, I read it a while ago. I don't know if I'm that well positioned to to to, to talk about it. Honestly, I'm also British, bullish on interoperability, though. Um, yeah, it, okay. it's kind of like the the way Khan described it to me was like Thorchain um, with smart yeah, contracts, but but with Thorchain with smart yes, contracts. Exactly. Yes, it's, it is. It's exactly yes. that. It's 
It's thought chain with smart. It's cross chain. You basically from. I mean, if they deliver what they say they're going to deliver, you don't need to use any other protocol because you can just do everything through their protocol. That's that's what it is. Yeah. All right. In the interest of time, Thicky, you said you're going to give us three. You gave us the the cross chain one called Holograph or Hologram. Holograph. Yes, it's launching yes. Uh, in uh, June or July. Um, for liquid on the liquid side, like. You know, obviously, Say has done very well with the parallelized EVM narrative. Monad's going to be like one of the biggest launches of this year. But like in terms of like a lower cap thing, I'm very bullish on Canto. Uh, they're following a very similar roadmap to Say, and they're only worth like 130 million dollars market cap. And um, Canto was also one double dipping with the RWA narrative. Yeah, one so last. This was the last last cycle. It was one of the darlings of the last cycle. If I remember correctly, it was quite a fast blockchain, and I think they. Their, their selling point at the time, and I may, I may be wrong here, was something about giving the fees back to the app, app developers or something like that, right? Was that, was that the model? Yeah, something like that. And they had a lot of like uh, RWA issuers built on top of them. It was a very popular narrative in 2023, which and is like making resurgence now. So you think it is going to come back to life? I think so. I think so. I, I, I think especially relatively to like the say valuation, there's a lot of room to like, make up there, you know, say it like 9 billion. It is, I mean, it is a fully diluted valuation of 343 million. All right, listen, guys, we are completely out of time. Uh, great alpha here today. Thank you so, so, so much for being here. Enjoy the rest of your Easter with your, your families. Thank you for the alpha. Sending you guys much love. Guys, remember, if you want to follow any of the guests, their Twitters and Peach channel is uh, listed below in the description. Sending you guys much love. And to you guys, the band fam, don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. I want to ask you a question. If you have enjoyed this alpha, let me know about it. And also, if you want to join the team that helps us produce this alpha. And what I mean is, we are looking for people that are absolutely, absolutely obsessed with narratives, obsessed with, 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 uh, with crypto alpha, and want to join our research team. So you're not going to be writing long research reports because that's not what we do. You're going to be surfing Twitter. You're going to be surfing Telegrams. You're going to be surfing Discord channels. You're going to look for Alpha and you're going to help us compile the content that does the show. If you want to join the research team, in the description, there is a link. Fill in the link. That's going to take you to a questionnaire. Now, you need to answer the questions in the questionnaire and don't use ChatGPT and don't use Google because if you pass that questionnaire, we're going to have a face-to-face -face interview with you and we're going to ask you a whole lot of these questions. And if you use ChatGPT, you're not going to be able to answer them and you're just going to look like an idiot. So, if you, want to sign, if you want to sign up, we are looking to hire five researchers to join our team globally. Uh, fill in the questionnaire below. There is a questionnaire in the link. Um, and that will uh, help you uh, get, a, get, a, get a role. It, it's obviously a paid role. We're looking for full-time researchers only. So only if you want to leave your current job and get into crypto and join the banter fam, join the team, be part of our research team that puts together the, 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 the research calls, the shows, et cetera, et cetera. We want you to join the team. All right, guys, I'm going to go and spend Easter weekend with my family. I will see you guys again on Monday. Until then, trade well, my friends.